the choices you make and specifically the way you choose to see God matters. How you choose to interpret the circumstances of your life matters because what you choose to believe about Him is who you'll show others that He is. Will you choose to see Him through the eyes of fear and doubt or through the understanding of a God who not only loves us, but is love? Join me today as we learn to see Him rightly, as we learn to choose love. Hello and welcome back to Choose Love. It's been a couple of months. I cannot believe it. It's gone by so fast, but I'm really glad that I took some time off. I never want these um, episodes or programs, our time together here, to feel like a burden or an obligation for me um, because I want it to always flow from just a place of overflow in my own relationship with the Lord. And there are times where I know I just need to pull back and just connect with Him without the need to make it make sense for you guys as well. And so I appreciate you guys being flexible and being on this journey with me. Um, Johnny was reminding me that you know, for two years, um, I did Choose Love just about every day. So the first year was through video and then um, through, uh, you know, audio. And so this weekly um, program, I think, is just a real good sweet spot for me right now. I'm about to be a second time grandmother. We have a, a grandson, our second grandson, due any day now. And I told Johnny last night, I said, there's something in me that just wants to like quit everything else and just, you know, be a grandmother. And I'm not going to do that, but boy, is it tempting. Um, but there's just too much um, that the Lord has stirred in me that I just know that I'm called to invest in you guys. And so it's really an honor and a privilege to do that. And I enjoyed some time just focusing on our family for the last couple of months. And, and like I said, some time just with the Lord and me. And I do feel like I'm in a place of overflow again. So I'm excited to jump in today with um, something that's super fresh. You know, we went on a little prayer retreat for almost two weeks to the beach at the beginning of January and just really... Um, enjoyed each other, but but especially enjoyed just some downtime with the Lord and praying into this new year. And, you know, whether you're watching this, you know, right now in January or it's a year or two from now, whenever you're watching this, I believe this, this is relevant for you right now where you are. Um, the Lord has been speaking to me about you know, just what it's like to believe in him versus trying to believe in him and the difference between actually knowing him and believing in him. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. But more than that, I really want to just be in the Lord's presence together. And I want to help you have your own, you know, time with him, encounter him today and so I want to just start by inviting um, and acknowledging his presence that's with us, with you, right where you are right now. And I want to tell you that, um, you know, for me, sometimes if I get in a worship mode, it really helps me to feel that connection with the Father in a, in a more powerful way. And so if that's true for you, you know, I can't play music on here without it being a little complicated because of the licensing and all of that. But you could pause this and however you listen to music, find some instrumental worship music and maybe have it playing along with um, the video here that you're watching or the podcast that you're listening to and just get into that place of more than it's about what I have to say is about you having time with the Lord right now. And I believe in that place, he's going to speak some really powerful things um, to your heart. And when he speaks to our heart, sometimes it's with words and sometimes it's just, it's just becomes a part of us. And it changes something in us that we don't even necessarily have words for because he didn't give it to us through words. 
So expect something from him today. Um, so let's just start with prayer. Father, I um, just still myself right now in your presence and I ask that you would help each one of us do that. Like from the inside out, things that are noisy and bumping all around inside of us, those thoughts that just race to and fro, I ask that you would just quiet them. And we know that in your word, you say that we are to be still and know that you are God. So we ask for that stillness right now. God, I pray for every single person that's listening that that you would impart that stillness to their spirit, to their mind, to their emotions right now. And we ask you to teach us how to be with you. It looks different, sounds different, depending on the season we're in, depending on what's going on in our in our lives and where you have us focused. So for for where we are right now, we ask that you would um, just reveal yourself. We want to know you. We want to be so completely convinced of who you are and what you're like, your character, your nature, your thoughts, your heart towards us, that it's just a part of who we are, that we see life through that knowing. And we give you permission to, to say the things to our hearts that we need to hear today to accomplish that, to accomplish that stillness and that knowing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, you know, uh, back to the beach when I was on this prayer retreat with Johnny, I had this new revelation. Um, when my daughters were little, I would always stand them in front of the ocean. And I don't know if they remember this or not, but I would stand them in front of the ocean, especially if I was with one of them, you know, off on a walk on the beach alone. And, you know, I grew up going to the beach from when I was very young, probably every summer, or most summers um, for a week or so. And we did the same thing with our kids. And I would stand them there and just say, just like, look out over the ocean. Can you see where it ends? And they would be like, no, you know, it just keeps going and going. And I would say, well, that's God's love for you. That's what God is like. He's like this giant ocean. He, he just loves you so much. It just is beyond anything you could ever completely know or experience or understand because his love is so huge, so wide, so vast, so deep for you. And I always loved just that picture of giving that to them because that's how the Lord would always speak to me um, through the years, you know, growing up, going to the beach. And then even as an adult, like I, I always, I just feel so drawn to that, that shore of these depths of waters that sometimes are turbulent and sometimes are just so still and, and clear and you can just see to the bottom and um, there's something about being at the ocean at the shore and also seeing a sunrise or sunset for me it's never the sunrise I'm not up for the sunrise but it's always the sunset and and the way that it that it reflects off the water and on the edge of where the water just goes and goes and goes it's this bright ball of fire and Sometimes it just explodes up into the clouds. And, you know, I, we all, in the days of social media and stuff, you just want to take pictures of, of the ocean and the way the waves come in and, and show people, you know, where you are. And yet it kind of always looks the same, just pretty much from wherever you are. But there's something, I think, in all of us that are drawn to the ocean shore. 
And so I began just like asking the Lord about that on this recent trip while I was on a walk with him one day. And he began speaking to me, um, kind of just a new, fresh perspective. And and he said, for the first thing he said, and it just, there was no more conversation after that. It was just, um, it was walk, he said, walking on the shores of my heart. You're walking on the shores of my heart. And that was enough for me. Like just, wow, that, that was just really sweet. And I, I, it affirmed like we're on a walk together, you know, but then another time I was walking on the same beach and the Lord just began to kind of break it down for me. And I want to do that for you in just a minute, kind of the way that he presented it to me. But first I want us to get into um, a little bit of this conversation about the knowledge of God, because it one feeds into the other. There is um, something that happens, a lot of things that happen when you know God. And that could be a very presumptuous statement. And so I want to say I don't presume to like know God exhaustively by any means. I, I do know him though, and he knows me. And there's a confidence that I have in that place that I think um, is pretty rare. Um, you know, it's one thing to know about someone or about God. It's another to actually know someone. And I like to use concrete examples. So for example, like my husband, I know Johnny Inlow. I know pretty much how he's going to act or what he's going to say in most settings and situations. Occasionally, you know, I'll get a surprise out of him. Um, but I know him because I've been with him for so many years, so many moments, so many conversations. There's nothing that someone could tell me about him that I would be tempted to believe that's not true about him because I know him. It doesn't take effort or I don't have to work at believing in or believing Johnny Enlow, my husband, because I know him. And I see um, a lot of striving in many religions, including Christianity, to believe, right? And then you see, you know, whole segments of populations and segments of generations, um, especially there's a, um, a whole lot of, unfortunately, young adults right now that are going through what they call deconstructing their faith. And you just see, um, you know, the how they've bailed on this idea of belief in God. And it, it's so tragic to me. And there's a part of me, honestly, that I, I, I just can't relate to it at all. I don't, I don't, it's like me trying to believe in Johnny, as I said, like I, I know him, so I don't have to try to believe in him. And for me personally, you know, we all have our own journey that we've been on with God. And for me personally, I've known God since I was very little. I remember when I was about four years old, um, having that aha moment where I knew there was a God and I knew I needed to tell him that I was sorry for lying because I had just lied about something to my mom. And I remember, I think I was crying and saying to her, you know, I need to say, I'm sorry. I need to say that I lied. And she helped me pray and told me how to pray to God. And I just remember like the relief of feeling. Now I know what to call it restored to my father. Um, and so that began for me a lifelong 
discovery of who he is and what he's like. So in this topic of the knowledge of God, you know, there's a verse, um, Habakkuk 2.14, that we, we refer to a lot. I just filmed up for discussion with Johnny, and so some of the things are a little similar. So if I repeat myself, and I've already said it on here, I'm sorry. It's because I didn't think that I had said it because I thought I said it on the other program. But regardless, it's okay to hear repetition. It helps us um, remember things. But Habakkuk 2.14, the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth. How? As the waters cover the sea. I love this connection between the knowledge of God and the picture of the ocean. Um, and I'm going to, like I said, get into that a little bit more in a minute. But the knowledge of God is so important because specific things happen when we know God. Now, I can say from my own experience that um, I didn't... Let's see where this is in my notes. For me, I didn't come to know him through supernatural experiences. I'm not even sure I've had supernatural experiences that are like obvious. I mean, I'm sure that there are angels that are active in my life on my behalf, etc. Um, supernatural, I got the gift of tongues when I was like um, 11 ish years old and so that's supernatural but I've never seen angels I've never seen demons I've never dreamed um something where it felt like like God was in specifically in the dream or or like a supernatural dream where I'm where I'm sure that I'm with God or I'm experiencing angels or demons or something like that I've never um I've never had like an audible voice of God or, or something like that. Okay. So when I talk about knowing God for me and, and those things are legitimate and there are people that have had the knowledge of God in their own life, um, advanced out of some supernatural experiences. And that's amazing. I'm a little jealous to be honest with you. And I remember I, for years, I used to ask for that on a regular basis and then I just, you know, I grew weary in asking, to be honest with you, and just was like, God, if that's important in our relationship, I welcome it. And I'm going to leave that up to you. That's where I landed with it. But I'm saying that because I want you to know that it's been more from walking through life with God, wrestling with him over all kinds of things, and just learning how to be with him. Just literally learning how to be with him. Again, back to like a natural description in a regular natural relationship, you know, you learn how to be with people and it's different depending on who the person is. Um, Johnny and I, you know, we're, we've learned how to be with each other in different seasons of life too. Like when, when we don't have kids living in the house anymore, we we are with each other in a way that's different than when, you know, we had little ones at home or when we first met each other or when we were, you know, newlyweds the first year. It, 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 um, it unfolds, it evolves, it, it goes into deeper depths. And it's that way in our relationship with God. And I say that because I want to validate what you have with God. Sometimes we don't see what we have until someone else points it out. And then we're able to value it more. And what we value, we can build on and we can be more intentional about. And so there's a way that you have learned to just be with God. If you haven't, then by all means, like ask him to teach you. Sometimes when, when I say being with God, I literally mean like, closing a door and getting alone and just sitting in his presence. Maybe I'm reading scripture. Maybe I'm listening to worship music, or maybe it's complete silence. Maybe I'm wailing and in a fetal position and, you know, wrestling through something major with the Lord, or maybe I'm, um, 
not feeling anything. And I'm just by faith going, you're here with me. And so I just want to be with you. And then most of the time, being with God for me just looks like acknowledging him and bringing him into my internal dialogue throughout any given day, no matter what I'm facing, whether it's, you know, there's, there's some times where I was telling Johnny this the other day, I almost feel guilty. I'm, I'm used to like so much trauma happening around me my entire life that on days and weeks and months where everything is more stable, um, I, I'm like, am I too comfortable? You know, do I know how to be with God and stay hungry when, when I like where things are at? You know, it's sometimes if you're, if you're used to things, uh, boat rocking, then you get into this rhythm of crying out to him that keeps all of that stirred in you. But in this, um, season, whatever the season is that you're in, in life and with the Lord, your relationship with him, it's all important. Learning how to be with him in any kind of setting, in any kind of scenario is to me what the whole purpose of life is. It's the whole point is to grow in our knowledge of God. And the thing is, the more you come to know him, Okay, this is one of the benefits of what happens when you know God. The more you know him, the more you care about what he cares about because you start getting to know his heart and his desires. And even the ones you don't know to put into words, you just live them out. And you notice, you find yourself being drawn to a situation or a person that needs compassion or a situation that is unjust and you're like, a, an anger rises up in you. And then learning how, how do you, what do you do with the emotions of God? Um, I'm going to get ahead of myself here for a second, but the ocean is such a perfect picture of the emotions of God, the depths of how he feels. Um, there's scripture, I meant to look this up, but um, it says, behold, both the kindness and the severity of our God. It's not, it's not like he's loving, but he's also scary, not in a negative way. It's like he's passionate. He, he, he feels, he's, he's angry when things, um, when humanity is, is affected in a negative way by evil because he so didn't mean it to be that way. Like he, he had our best intention and we chose as humanity, we chose um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so evil is in the earth and, and his that's that that turbulent water that that we we experience in our own emotions because we're made in his image and when we see something that's unjust it ticks us off you know and um and when when we see a sunset or we see a, a newborn baby or we um see something that's beautiful that just captures us it it causes us to cry because we're made in his image. I believe that, that, that God has those depths of feeling within him. So my point with that was what happens when you know God, you care about what he cares about, but then you learn how to care the way he cares. So we know that our relationship with God was never meant to be a performance. It was never about earning our way through what we do into his heart or into heaven. But yet we also know that faith without works is dead. If true faith exists, then it's going to provoke us to action. So our lives are going to be an expression of how he cares what he cares about, the way he cares. And, and the love of God is never um, stagnant. It's not just a concept that exists. It actually accomplishes things. His love 
goes in and changes things, it rearranges things, it heals things, it fixes things, it sets up new possibilities. And so our, our care, our, our knowledge of God was meant to translate to caring and then to translate to caring how he cares in an actionable, actionable tangible, practical way. And so the knowledge of God ultimately is an action. It's, it's action coming through us, through you and me. But it's an overflow of just learning how to be with him. Because when you learn how to be with him, that's where the knowledge of God is, um, is uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it grows. It 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 begins to take root and and grow up into a tree that Scripture says has leaves on it that are for the healing of the nations. There, are, you you are called an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. There are leaves a fruit of your life that actually will change things the more your roots go down into the knowledge who God is, what he's like, his heart, his thoughts towards you and eventually towards others. All right, what happens when you know God? Your faith accesses things in the spirit realm so you're not limited to options in the natural realm. For example, all right, when Jesus met, um, if you've been watching the Chosen series, and you know there's a, a moment in there that came from Scripture where um, a Roman officer, a man who was not, not even uh, a, a Jewish believer, you know, he didn't, he, this is not a man who had a relationship with God. This is a man who stood against those who had a relationship with God. This is a man who um, was pagan. I mean, he probably literally worshiped other gods, false gods. And this Roman officer knew, something in him knew Jesus so well that he said, if, if you, I think he had a sick, um, Someone at home was sick or dying. I don't remember if they had already died or I get my healing stories confused. But he said, if you'll just speak the word, I know that he will be healed or, or raised from the dead, whatever it was. And that's like, there's just something in him that just knew God in Jesus. And we know over and over again that Jesus would tell those that he would heal, your faith has made you whole. Even though he's the one that either prayed over them or, you know, the woman with the issue of blood, she reached out and touched the, the hem of his garment, his prayer shawl, and, and she was healed. But he made a point to say to her, it's your faith that made you whole. So again, your faith accesses things in the spirit realm so that you're not limited to options in the natural. We have limited options in the natural of what can happen when we're sick or when we're in lack of, of something. But when you factor in your faith, you literally access in the spirit realm things that you couldn't have accessed if you didn't have faith. So what does faith have to do with knowing God? Well, again, you don't have to work to believe something about someone when you know them. It's not hard for me to believe that, you know, Johnny and Lowe um, loves Peruvian food. You know, I know him. I know he loves Peruvian food. So I don't have to have faith that he's going to one day go to a Peruvian restaurant. I know that he's going to go uh, to a Peruvian restaurant because he loves Peruvian food. I know that about him. And so when you grow in your own personal knowledge of God, you're actually growing in your faith. It's a byproduct. Your faith grows. So when you're in a situation where you need to access 
something other than what the natural realm can provide for you, you have access to it through your faith because you know God. Um, and guess what? We see through these same examples that faith pleases God. Jesus got giddy. He got excited. It's your faith that made you whole. Like it, it pleased him as um, the son of God to see whenever someone had faith, he would say, I've never seen faith like this. He said about the Roman um, officer that came to him. He said, I've never seen faith like this in anyone in the house of Israel. You know, those that have been raised to believe in God. I've never seen this kind of faith. He was excited. He was proud of him. And it's no different. Jesus was showing us what our father's like. God, our father is so pleased when we have faith. And I'm telling you, faith is a byproduct of being with him and growing in your knowledge of him. Um, and let's see what else I was going to say about that. Your faith pleases God. Okay, we know in Hebrews, there's that long list of those that died not having seen the promise fulfilled, but yet their faith was accounted to them as righteousness. Um, that's powerful. So we know that faith pleases God. All right. What happens when you know God? It's not hard to believe in someone you actually know. And guess what? When you know God, you're actually part of the victory. You're part of the story that God is telling. You don't remove yourself from this grand love story that he's telling. You're front and center. When you know God, you are front and center in this story that ends in victory. He told us in Habakkuk 2.14 and in another scripture that I'm going to read you in a moment, he told us that this is all going to end with the knowledge of the glory of God filling the earth. That's the story of victory. Right now, culture, these seven mountains, these areas of culture are so broken, they actually are promoting the opposite of the knowledge of God. They're promoting lies about God. You know, when you are a part of an economic system that's rooted in greed. It's actually perpetuating a lie about God to people's hearts that, hey, God's not taking care of me. Even if he exists, he's not taking care of me. I have to take care of myself and I got to be greedy and I got to care for me, mine, and my own. I can't afford to be generous um, like God is, like we know God is, because there is no provider. And so you see how a broken economic system perpetuates a lie about God. Um, because what happens is in a broken economic system that's rooted in greed, if you make wealth or you at least are able to care for yourself, then you continue to solidify that lie in your heart, at least on a subconscious level, that there is no God, the provider, that you're it. And good job, you for being greedy enough or working hard enough, you know, it's all on you and you pulled yourself up. So these areas of culture were meant to be where we get to see and experience the truth about who and how God is, not a lie, but currently we're experiencing a lot of lies. Um, so my point with that is there is where this is all headed is the opposite of where we are right now that the knowledge of the glory of God is going to fill the earth. These seven mountains, these areas of culture, at least in a majority of the earth, are going to begin to look more and more like the kingdom way of doing things. Not religion, not Christianity, but like actually the principles of the character of God. Generosity, using that same example from the mountain of economy. Generosity, that's where true wealth is created, is when it's a win-win for everyone involved. Um, and things are done ethically, morally, etc. Okay, so what happens when you know God? You care about what he cares about. What happens when you know God? Your discernment grows. Um. It's hard to find truth right now. 
But when, when you align your spirit continually with, with God, his love, his presence, his heart for you, the scripture, you know, the word of God that helps ground us in the standard for what truth is, then when you hear something that is either not true or not the whole truth, something in you goes, ah, this, this isn't right. And that's important because we are in days and for generations we have been now where, where we are being seduced intentionally um, to call evil good and good evil. And it's so important that our discernment be sharp. So when you know God, your discernment um, grows. When you know God, you find peace in storms. Because you know him, you know where this is all headed, you know that he cares, and so you're not freaking out, wondering, does he even see me? No, he sees me, he's got me, he's not going to let me be tempted beyond what he's not willing to give me grace and strength to go through. Even if he's allowing me to go through a storm, he's in it with me, and you know, there's so many examples of that with Jesus. I don't want to go into all that now, but you find peace in storms when you know God. Not when you have to like, you know, life continually tempts us to believe lies about ourselves, lies about God, and lies about what God thinks about us. And when you allow yourself to go on those roller coasters of what I call, he loves me, he loves me not. You know, a little kid that's picking the petals off of a flower. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. He loves. That up and down part of life happens when we don't settle once and for all within ourselves a, a, a steely resolve that I know there is a God. I cannot be shaken from that. I don't care if... If I never see evidence of him again, I will not be moved from this point. And when we have a steely resolve to know that he actually loves us, that he, that he, he enjoys us, that he doesn't need us to be perfect. He just wants relationship with us and out of relationship, he is perfecting us. He is growing us up and maturing us. And when you settle that within you, then those things that, that happen in life don't rattle you the same way. Yeah, it hurts. You get mad. You're, you don't like going through uncomfortable, traumatic things, but you don't let it rock your whole world and your entire belief system. You know, you just, you're grounded in the fact that there is a God and he is good and he does know you and you know him. He loves you. You love him. And there's a loyalty that you just settle into and it's, it, it stabilizes you. Lastly, what happens when you know God? And it's basically what I just said. Something happens when you go through contradictions and lies about him and you settle your heart and you let go of offense. There's going to be so many times in life to look back on and you've yet to experience, unfortunately, that you're going to become offended ultimately with God if you're real honest with yourself. Because even if you can point at a person, if you believe in God, then you naturally believe that he's big and powerful and he's the only one who could have prevented it or intervened and he didn't. So even if... Even if it's something that you kind of did to yourself, a choice that you made, there's a part of you that will occasionally have compassion on yourself where you, you're like, I'm just, I'm just a little peon trying to get through life and he's God and he knows everything. Why, why couldn't he have helped me avoid that ditch, right? So there's lots of opportunities to be offended. And when you know God, you're so addicted to having, 
having him near, like wanting to feel connection and not disconnection from him. Once you experience that connection with God, like you miss it when you don't have it. It, it you literally become addicted to it. And there's something in you that, that says, I gotta, I gotta get on the other side of this offense so that I stay in that place of feeling the connection that I know I already have with him. And um, lastly, you become grounded in who he is. And guess what? We don't have to understand the God that is limitless, like inexhaustible. We can't possibly understand the totality of who he is or his heart for us. It's just vast to experience it. You can actually experience something you can't understand. You can be changed by something you don't understand. You can be empowered by something that you don't understand. The joy and the fun is knowing that you can grow in your understanding, but you actually have access to all of who God is right now. Right now. You don't have to do or change or be anything different to have access to all of who God is. He makes himself fully available to us. It's just up to us. And so back to where we started on the shores of his heart, walking on the shores of his heart. Um, he began to show me that the knowledge of God you know, if you describe him in the most simple way to, to describe him and to actually know him and experience him is God is love. God is love. That's just, just encapsulates it all. But obviously there's like so many different aspects to his love. His love is not just a gushy, sweet feeling and only, you know, rainbows, right? His love is, um, is also truth, and sometimes it's hard to hear. His love is, um, is passionate, and sometimes it's angry, and not in an irresponsible kind of anger, but in a righteous anger. His, his love is, um, is a, it's a standard, it's a plumb line. His love is his holiness, and his holiness is so other than humanity that it literally in the, it, it, it can consume you. In the Old Testament, you had, um, you know, the holiness of God that only Moses got to experience because everyone else was too afraid. You know, they, they, they knew that if they experienced it, it would literally like consume them. When Moses asked to see the essence of who and what God is, his glory, God literally had to hide him in the crack of a huge rock so that when his glory, who he was, passed by him, his holiness, it wouldn't kill him physically. So this is all wrapped up in this just simple concept of who is God? God is love. And so I think of this, you know, standing on the shores as being just like the shores of his heart and his heart for us is love. Um, you know, I just want to like pray into this and allow you just to experience it um, with him right now. So I would just encourage you wherever you are to just get in that place of being with him. And I'm just going to pray into this and we'll end, we'll end here together um, over the next you know, a few minutes. So Holy Spirit, would you just take each one of us right now on a walk on the shores of our Father's heart? Would you remind us what it's like, even in the natural, to just walk along the shores of, of an ocean where the, the waves are coming and going? And I just just want to remind you of what that looks like in the natural so that we can experience that in the spirit realm. But in, in the ocean, there's um, obvious 
aspects that we get to see and touch. You know, we can walk on the shores and we can feel the water on our feet. We can even go in, you know, in ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. We can go in over our heads. We can, we can play in the, in the shores of the breaking waves. And we can even see, you know, the things from the depths of the ocean that wash up on the shore. We can see um, little shells and broken shells. Sometimes we find whole huge shells. It's very rare, but we 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 see that these these little little tastes of the depths of of the waters of the sea just kind of come up. Um, we see the green sea life, and we see. Um, fish and and creation. We see the um, different kinds of plants that grow in the water that wash up, and they give us a taste of what we can't see. That's in the deeper parts, the deeper aspects um, of of you know deep waters, and. We know because we've had people go into deeper, deeper places in the ocean, then there are even things that exist in the depths of caverns and and they say the opposite of mountains, these these huge deep crevices in the in the um, landscape of the bottom of the ocean that hold creatures and and sea life that that can't even exist in the higher um, levels of the water, but but they're there nonetheless. Even though we cannot see and experience them, they're there. And they're part of who you are as creator God. And we see as we walk um, on the edge of the shore that there's ebb and flow to the waters. And we see that sometimes it's it's um, just peaceful and at other times it's turbulent and it's stirred up and it's scary and we wouldn't dare go into those turbulent waters. Um, yet we're drawn to it. We're drawn to something that we could be consumed by. We're drawn to the taste of the beauty and the majesty of this part of your creation. We're drawn to the mystery of of what's out there that we can't see, but we know is there. We're drawn to the power that is in um, the current that is flowing like rivers within the ocean and the current that that comes in the ebb and the flow of, of these waves that come in and go out. And we're drawn to the movement of the water. Um, we're drawn to the, the reflection of the colors from the sky and from, from the sun and the moon, all the brilliant colors that are part of your, your creatures that, you know, we, we snorkel and we venture into the depths of the ocean and we see these brilliant, vibrant colors that exist in the sea life. And um, we're just drawn by how you've hidden so much beauty in these depths places that that we can't we can't breathe we can't function in a normal way but we are drawn to and we know that you created it for us and so in the same way right now we just we want to express to you our desire to learn how to walk on the shores of your heart I just, when I was walking, I felt like the Lord showed me that all of the creation that is hidden in the ocean, from the sea life to the, um, the rocks and the corals, the reefs, things that are alive and things that are not, all that is in it, the currents, everything that is included in these oceans, these seas, they're all pictures of the the revelation that is available in his heart and yet we settle for these little bitty broken slivers of of 
shells that wash up on the beach and and he's okay with that. He loves the joy we get. You know, I'm, when I would walk my children on the beach, I remember my youngest daughter, Glory, she was the one that loved to pick up the broken shells. And I would tell her, those are broken. Let's don't take those home. Let's look for the ones that are, that are you know, complete. And she would say, no, mama, these are the pretty ones. I like the broken ones. And that's, that's so my girl, but that is so the Lord as well. Like he's okay with any level of revelation that we manage to draw up from the depths of his heart. And it's in this place of learning how to be with him, walking on the shores of his heart, that he does cause revelation to just wash up right in front of us where it's undeniable and we learn things and he teaches us things. But he's also saying, would you come deeper into the depths of my heart for you? And with everything that is within us, God, we say yes. Teach us how to say yes. And we, we, we're like, there's a healthy fear. We don't presume to, to know the fullness of who you are. We don't presume to be so familiar with, with you any more than we would presume to be familiar with the ocean and just go try to live in it. You know, it, 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 um, it is, it is life-giving and yet it is a, a, a place of sheer terror if it's turbulent. And, um, and we know that that in you there is an awe and a healthy fear of your holiness, of, of the things about you that um, we can't completely comprehend. And yet you invite us in and you say, come and walk on the shores of my heart and, and dare to venture out and walk on the waters. Come to me and let walk with me. Let me let me show you the deeper things, the deeper revelations. And so would you teach us? Would you teach us? We want to grow in the knowledge of who you are, your heart towards us. Whenever I take my last breath, I want to know that I have made it my life's priority, that I've spent my life's energy on learning you, on, on knowing your heart. And we acknowledge that in that place of knowing your heart, we're going to make you known because we won't be able to help but make you known make you known as Savior and Lord, but also make you known as the provider and economy, the communicator and media, the, the father, the perfect parent in family. But these nuanced aspects of who you are and what you're like in these areas of culture that are going to fill the earth with the knowledge of your glory. It'll come through us and what a privilege to know you and to learn how to just be with you. Would you retune, reacclimate our hearts, God, in those places where any of us have held a fence towards you because of disappointment and the way life went or didn't go? We just lay it at your feet again and we just say we refuse to live offended. We may need to wrestle some things out with you and you get that, but we, we're not going to live from a place of bitterness or disconnect from you. Thank you for the joy and privilege of knowing you. I declare over every person that is listening, that is watching, that you were created to know God. You were created to learn and to, to enjoy every single day, just being with him. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, I just bless you. I want to end with um, two scriptures. One is from Hebrews chapter 8, um, verse 10. I'm in the Passion Translation. Uh, this is the second part of verse 10. I will be 
their loyal God, and they will be my loyal people. There is a level of loyalty that I think I mentioned this earlier that stabilizes you where you're like, I, I'm, I am loyal to you. I'm loyal to who I know you to be. No matter what happens in my life, no matter other people deconstructing their faith, whatever's shifting and changing around me, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stay loyal to the God who is loyal to me. Goes on to say in verse 11, and the result of this will be that everyone will know me as Lord. So what's the result of your loyalty to God and his loyalty to you? Others will know that he is the Lord. There will be no need at all to teach their fellow citizens or brothers saying, you should know Yahweh since everyone will know me inwardly. From the most unlikely to the most distinguished, for I will demonstrate my mercy to them and will forgive their evil deeds and never remember again their sins. Now, the context of this is important, but um, for certain aspects of this revelation. Obviously, he's not saying that, you know, in the end, everybody just gets forgiven whether they asked or not, and no matter what evil deed they did, he is willing to forgive, but there has to be, obviously, repentance. But my point with reading the scripture was there is an, there is an afterglow of your loyalty to God, your unshakable commitment to who he is and how he is. He's good. He loves us. He's got a plan. There is hope. When you stay grounded in that, people actually have an opportunity to know the God that you know. It's just going to happen. It's an overflow of our loyalty to him. All right. The last scripture is from Isaiah. Now, um, there is a book of the Passion Translation of Isaiah, it's separate than the New Testament with the Psalms and the Proverbs. So you kind of have to piece together the Passion Translation. Um, but I'm, I'm in the process of going through Isaiah in this translation, and it's so good. But I came across something in all my years of reading scripture. I never knew that Habakkuk 2.14 is said two times in the Bible. And anything where there's a double witness is like, it's done. It's done. And here is the double witness of Habakkuk 2.14. Habakkuk 2.14 says, where this is all headed is the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Well, it says it here in Isaiah chapter 11, verse, um, the second part of verse 9. For the earth will be filled with the intimate knowledge of the Lord Yahweh, just as water swells the sea. Again, I love that connection between the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of God, like people loyal to who he is and how he is, no matter what things look like around them, just like the water of the ocean. It's, it's his heart. It's a picture of his heart. We're staying loyal to something we can't possibly know or understand. You know, it's, I, I, I hope that you're seeing this connection here. Just as waters swell the sea. He has a little footnote here that says um, that it, there's also the Septuagint, which is one of the early translations, uses a, pre, a present tense verb. So it would read like this, for the earth is presently filled to the brim with the intimate knowledge of the Lord Yahweh, just like water swells in the ocean. Meaning it's already accessible. The kingdom of God is already at hand for those who can receive it. The, the, the knowledge of God is already accessible to us. We just have the opportunity any given moment throughout any given day, throughout our lifetimes, 
of learning how to be with him so that we can know him. You know him better than you think you do already. Because he's been with you before you drew your first breath. Sometimes it's just getting still enough. This is where we started, getting still enough to know. So I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. I, I always want to bring it back to where are you in your personal pursuit of the Lord? Actually, that was one scripture I didn't read because I had a third scripture. And it is this. It's Hosea 6, 3. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. I think that's a great place to end. And I'll see you next week on Choose Love.